there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Each year, over 300 million passengers fly over 6 billion miles on long-haul flights. Epic daily journeys made by some of the world's biggest planes. Like flying hotels, they transport people across the world in comfort and style. But what does it take to keep these giants in the sky? All our team is running to action. It's almost like a choreographed dance. But the key is just keeping moving. Come with us as we hitch a ride on one of the longest journeys in the world, London to Sydney, Australia. As with exclusive behind the scenes access, we can reveal the confessions of the cabin crew. Sometimes we do get a few weird requests, such as marriage proposals. We go below stairs to their secret crew rest. And welcome to our secret sleepover <laughs> joint. <laughs> we meet the back office staff, who monitor every second of each flight. The ISC is the nerve center to the airline. Without us, they literally would be flying blind. And follow the stories of passengers, both animal and human, who have their own reason to board flight 002 from London today. From starting a new life down under, it's a big move for both of us. We haven't got a clue what to expect. To meeting a long-lost family for the very first time. They've been looking for me for 20 years. Filmed at 40,000 feet, this is the ultimate insider's guide to life in the skies. So make sure your seat is in the upright position and your seatbelt is fastened as we prepare to uncover the secret life of the long-haul flight. It's just before dawn at London's Heathrow. The world's largest passenger plane, the Airbus A380, is towed onto stand. Costing over 280 million pounds, it's 73 meters long, 25 meters high, and has a tip-to-tip -tip wingspan of 80 meters. In just two hours' time, it will depart on its daily long-haul flight to Sydney, Australia. Loaded with up to 484 passengers, the 11,000-mile journey will take 24 hours. But long before the passengers can board, a whole army of service personnel must get her ready to fly. In the world of long-haul flying, there is not a second to lose. We don't want any of our planes hanging around the ground. The best place for our aircraft is operating within the air. So it's all hands on deck and everyone's onto the aircraft straight away to get their jobs done and we can make that turn around within that two hour time frame. Now a well-rehearsed ballet swings into action as the refuelers, baggage handlers, engineers, cleaners and catering teams all set to work. There's certain jobs that have to be done all the wheels have to be inspected, the engines have to be checked, oiled. You have to do a walk around to make sure there's nothing hanging off of the hole of the outside. Same for the inside. It's a very, very structured process and it's broken down minute by minute. Each department and each team have a job to do within a certain amount of time frame. It literally does go to the minute. Um, so we need to have the aircraft closed up by 10 minutes before departure. With our plane not suffering any serious faults, the engineers can crack on with more cosmetic jobs, like a sticky TV screen. Tiny screw, someone's just over tightened it. Can we get something in there to, like this? Yeah, to lever it. Yeah, that's the one. While below the wing, the action is in full swing. 90 minutes before departure, the 21 cabin crew clock in for their pre-flight briefing. We all have individual roles, like there are business and first-class flight attendants on board, um, economy flight attendants. Sarah Kelly has been flying for five years. For her, aviation is in the blood. My father is a Qantas captain, so yeah, I've just grown up with him travelling around and going to different exotic destinations and, yeah, just the whole thrill of just flying. There's somebody amongst the crew who uh, you've not met yet, 
please uh, spend some time having a little chat with him and uh, get to know each I'm other. On the tarmac, second officer Adam Thompson carries out his visual inspection. The purpose of the inspection is to make sure that there's no uh, ground service vehicles that cause any damage. There's nothing leaking from any pipes. It's not meant to be. In the engine, looking to see if there's been any scratches or dents on the fan blades, any indication that something's gone through the engine that shouldn't have, if they've had a, a bird strike perhaps or something like that on the previous sector. On the tyres, we're looking to see that there's no gashes or any, um, any problems at all with the tyres. On every long haul flight, each passenger has a story, and we're following four of them. We're just a long haul flight yeah. away from meeting three sisters. Malcolm and Adelaide are about to board their first long haul flight to meet the family they never knew they had. Well, just can't wait. I've never seen them in real life. I can't believe it. And young parents Daniel and Bethany are heading down under to see if they want to make Sydney their new home. Daniel, Bethany, and how Ilis. do I say Ilis? Ilis. Oh. We've got a lot planned. We've got a list written up of all the places we want to go and visit and different um, neighbourhoods we kind of want to see. And Exciting, really, isn't it? Back on the tarmac, second officer Adam Thompson checks the A380's huge wings, which are so large you could park 70 cars up there. They only just fit, really, don't they? They do only just fit, yeah. It's quite common on such a large aircraft to have a ground service vehicle follow us just to check the wingtips to make sure that we're all safe. You don't want to hit anything? They're not going to hit anything. How did it look? Looks very good. Good to go. Back in Terminal 3, 28-year-old Australian Sean checks in. Going home to surprise my mum for her 60th. She has no idea I'm coming. While fellow Aussie Belinda is leaving fiance Alice behind to return home after almost four years. We're getting married soon. We're getting married soon. It's going to be okay. Right, I love you. Although for her, the 24 hour flight time is a little overwhelming. I've done a lot of long haul flights, so it's not like I'm new to the game. Mm. Um, but I just find them rather horrendous, to be honest. Like, long. I don't think anyone enjoys a long haul flight. I know, <laughs> but I've. I don't know, I just dread it. And I think that's a part of it stopped me from going back all these years. But Belinda's in for a surprise, as she's been upgraded. Yay! It's actually business class, and actually I'm flying business class, which is crazy, because I've never flown any kind of class except a comedy. Econ how do you say it? Economy. Yeah, and I, I feel like I'm a little bit emotional, actually. Off to the gate. Here we go. We're baby's doing really well. Baby either, say hello. <laughs> Everyone wave. Yay! Hey. <laughs> and it's not just our human passengers that are about to go long haul. Every day, Qantas alone make 4,000 freight shipments. The two huge holes can carry up to 20 tonnes of freight. Although anything bigger than a suitcase is handled by the specialists. I would say we're a big check-in for freight. Just a few miles from Heathrow is Donata's bonded warehouse. A high security, 24-7 cargo facility where they handle up to 450 tonnes a day. We're open all the time, every day of the year. Uh, and it is, it's very fast paced. It comes in, it goes out. Anything from clothing to cars, live animals, absolutely anything. We had an armoured vehicle come in, customised, and had all leather seats in, fridges. So that was quite unusual. The A380 can even carry its own spare engines. Although at 10 tonnes apiece, it's a bit of a tight fit. They'll go out this afternoon on a special vehicle. They direct load onto the aircraft, just squeezes in and out. But, uh, yeah, that's quite tight. To 
today, it's not just jet engines and luxury cars that are going long haul, as two very important passengers arrive. Mitzi and Alfie are being relocated back to Australia. And a few days ago, it was time to say goodbye to Mum and Dad. Come on. We're gonna go. Quick, quick. We won't see them for about 12, 13 days, <laughs> which is a long time for us. And, and Mitzi here suffers from a little bit of separation anxiety, so um, <laughs> hopefully the flight's not too bad for them. Good boy, good boy. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. She's a little bit uncertain. She probably thinks we're going with her. She probably so does, yeah. So she's probably going to get a surprise. We're all going to go on a car so, ride. That's right. Yeah. So she's all up for the ride. It's just yeah. when, <laughs> when she works out, <laughs> we're not going. Mitzi and Alfie are travelling with a specialised pet transport service. And they've just realised they're going alone. I think they are, honey. See you soon. Freaking out. See you soon. but they're in safe hands, as the animal's welfare is top priority for all the airlines. Even before they fly, they get a thorough checkup. Australia especially are super paranoid about uh, importing infectious diseases, so that's parasites uh, and other signs of contagious diseases. So I just work from head to toe, go through these guys and make sure they're all well, everything's healthy. Lovely clean ears. Super. Go through his coat, make sure there's no signs of ticks, fleas, anything like that hanging around. Make sure his cardiovascular system's up to the trip. You are good. We'll have a look at your sister. But uh, I'm very happy with how things look with him. You worried you're coming on the table as well? I'm afraid you are. Pretty laid back customer. Nice steady heart rate. Nice clear chest. Good. Good. And it's not just domestic pets that travel long haul. Every day of the year, you could be sitting there on a plane, and below you don't realise there are literally half a dozen animals going from one place to another <coughs> around the world. And it's not just cats and dogs, there's exotics as well on international breeding programmes from zoo to zoo. The largest animal I've moved by air is a Asian one-horned greater rhino, rhinoceros. And I dare I say, how do you move a rhino? in a big box. <laughs> Today, the dogs are accompanied by a few feline friends, so Mick has to be careful about who sits where. We try and separate everyone. Uh, we've got some cats on the corner. Uh, we obviously face them away from the dogs, uh, so they don't upset each other. Uh, but, no, they all look quite happy this morning. Although the holds on the aircraft are pressurised, they are not usually heated, but with outside temperatures at 40,000 feet of minus 50 degrees centigrade, today, these guys will be well looked after. They'll actually warm the compartment so it's comfortable for the animals. Their main concern is their welfare. Mitzi and Alfie are just two of the 65,000 domestic pets carried by Qantas each year. A tiny fraction of the 100 million animals flown worldwide. Back at the airport, with just 60 minutes before departure, the catering trucks arrive. Specially built to reach the plane's two decks, the service team now has to replace 40,000 items, including 70 meal carts, two and a half thousand glasses, and 5,000 pieces of cutlery. With 45 minutes to go, boarding begins. But delays on the roads around Heathrow mean getting the flight away on time could be a challenge. As a consequence, we have late passengers and late crew. So we, um, everything that we did this morning was a little bit behind. There are a lot more to do. As the crew rushed to prep the plane, now even some of the checked-in passengers have gone walkabout. Thank 
Qantas, good morning. Oh, orange juice, thank you. 11 passengers missing. Where do they go? Um, this is the $1 million question. <laughs> but Inez is undeterred. For her, getting the flight away on time is a matter of pride. The flight on time is when I watch those wheels move right on the dot. If that doesn't happen, then we fail everyone that has worked very hard to get all the passengers, all the crew, you know, the, the aircraft at its destination. So, yes, it would be, uh, they would be disappointed in me if I didn't deliver. With boarding about to close, most of the passengers have been found. But there's always one. One prim economy, we're just trying to get a phone number. OK. Thank you, thank you, thank you, bye. So, uh, we are 20 minutes to departure, we're missing one passenger. And at minus 15 minutes, we start looking for their bags. Next, will Inez avoid costly delays and get flight 002 away on time? I sometimes say that waiting for the door to close ages me. <laughs> Good to you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jason Ng, and I'm your customer service manager. At London Heathrow, boarding of flight 002 to Sydney is almost complete, as the last passenger is rounded up. We've located him, and um, it is a him, is it? Yes. And um, yes, so we should be all good to go. Inez can now make sure the doors are all sealed. We're just waiting for engineers to get off, and then we'll stop close. I sometimes say that waiting for the door to close ages me. <laughs> that is a very happy moment. I know it's a bit sort of obvious because I work here, but that is <laughs> closing the door. With the door sealed, the aero bridges retract, and flight 002 is pushed back for takeoff on time. There she goes, and she slides away from us. Qantas 2, first take off, 279, wind 220, 14. Your clearance is confirmed. Confirmed. Takeoff is one of the most critical phases of the flight. Captain Rod Duncan and his crew now accelerate the plane to 138 miles per hour. We always only use as much thrust as we need. That just saves wear and tear on the engine. So it never seems to accelerate really quickly. As the speed increases, the air pressure around the massive wings changes. Now air flowing over the wing has a lower pressure than the air flowing under it. With enough speed, the pressure difference begins to lift the aircraft into the air. Once you get to that speed, if you have an engine failure or a major problem prior to that speed, you'll stop on the runway. And if you have an engine failure or a problem after that speed, you'll sort it out in the air. As the giant aircraft heads southeast, it's following the kangaroo route, a 70-year-old air link between Australia and the mother country. The 11,000-mile trip crosses Europe, the Middle East and the Indian Ocean before arriving in Australia in just over a day's time. One epic journey that's a tiny fraction of the 6.28 billion long-haul miles flown each year. Hi, so here I am in the business class section. I've just been given some champagne. Um, life is pretty good right now. Unfortunately, um, the baby Iris was sick on Bethany's shoulder, so not the greatest. But she's now fast asleep, so hopefully she can stay like that now for the rest of the flight.
In seat 70C, 65-year-old Malcolm has hardly ever flown before. This is the first time I've ever flown long, long haul. Oh, my gosh, ever flown long haul? Wow. So uh, what brings you to Australia? Oh, well, what it was, one, one Friday night, I opened him, go off watching television, got a phone call, this woman on the phone, again, she told me all my details and all that. She says, I'm your sister. <gasps> oh, Plus, my gosh. there's another two of us over here. Oh, wow! So I've got three. Malcolm's parents split up when he was just three months old. Until his sister, Alison, tracked him down in October 2016, he had no idea he had another family in Australia. She said, they've been looking for me for 20 years. My dad's been looking for me for 40 years. Well, I, I just went then, I just completely went. Tears were rolling down my face, it's both of us at either end. And we just, it, it was five, five minutes before we started talking and I, I just couldn't believe it. Malcolm's father, David, had joined the thousands of 10 pound poms who emigrated to Australia in the 1950s. Starting a new life, he had remarried and had three daughters. I could imagine how you would be feeling after that phone call. Oh, really yeah. surreal and... Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were on the phone for at least an hour and a half that night. It was just... The nicest thing I found out was he's been looking for me for all these years. You don't know how that makes me feel. And obviously the first thing is we've got to meet, we've got to meet. I don't know what's going to happen when I see him at the other end. Just see when you get off this plane, that's it. Yeah. That's it. I'm going to meet them all. Malcolm's dad passed away in 1996, having never been reunited with his son. And now Malcolm's got a lifetime of catching up to do with his new family. I'm never going to meet my dad in real life, but the next best thing... ..is my three sisters. Fabulous. Oh, I've got goosebumps everywhere. I'm actually tingling. It's so beautiful. That reminds me why this is my dream job. As Flight 002 begins its track across mainland Europe, 11,000 miles away in Sydney, it's just one of 100 Qantas flights that is being tracked second by second in the Integrated Operations Centre, or IOC. The ISC essentially is the nerve center to the airline. We provide information to all the aircraft that we have flying anywhere, anytime around the world. This system gives us a timeline of all the aircraft that we have at any given moment through their phase of flight. That information is updated as soon as an aircraft releases its brakes, takes off, lands, or comes back to the terminal. Yeah, that's right, we might be diverting to Sydney. Qantas 94. A lot can vary in approximately 18 to 24 hours, be that weather information, engineering, medical assistance, security assistance. So we're always providing updates to those aircraft throughout the course of their journey. OK, let me go and check with maintenance watch and I'll come back to you. And this communication isn't just one way, as each A380 is equipped with hundreds of sensors, which beam real-time data about the health of the plane and its engines across the globe. Have a look at the telemetry from the aeroplane at this stage and we'll see if it's carrying any defects which may cause us an issue. Although Flight 002 isn't reporting anything serious, it does have one or two minor niggles. All the aircraft carry some minor defects. It's like your car, the ashtray may be full or the window may not wind down properly or something like that. If it's a serious fault, there's other alerting from the engine manufacturers. They've been monitored. Also, Airbus themselves are monitoring our aircraft, and if they believe there's a serious issue, they can also send us uh, some additional information. If the engineers do spot a worrying problem, they can pick up the sat phone and talk directly to the pilots. We have to be very mindful that we don't bother them during a critical phase of flight. So if they're just starting their flight, we won't call, and if they're just towards the end of the flight, definitely won't be calling. Engineers like David 
are just one of the many unsung heroes of the long haul flight. One flight from London to Sydney could have anywhere from approximately 10 through to 50 people involved. So there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are making that aircraft get to where it's going. Without the IOC, the airline wouldn't function. You'd have aircraft in the air that wouldn't be able to get real-time information, be that mechanical, be that for weather, be that security or medical-related situations, and as a result, they literally would be flying blind. Which is exactly what used to happen when the pioneers of long haul took to the skies nearly 80 years ago. 1938, and QEA, Qantas Empire Airways, operates the short C-class flying boats in modern luxury and comfort. And what's more, the trip only takes nine days, which includes 70 hours of flying and 36 stops. Essentially, long haul was a series of short hops, none of them longer than 200, maximum 300 miles. Between each hop, you would come down, the plane would be refueled, you had to be adventurous. There was a lot of forced landings. You had to be prepared more or less for anything. There is even a demand for fishing lines at refueling stops, where both passengers and crew members can enjoy the relaxation of dropping a line over the side. Back on board, our passengers won't need to be fishing for their dinner. As just 30 minutes into the flight, it's time to eat. So, do you have a fruit, please? Of course you can. Getting my fruit out. Thank you very much. There you are, my pleasure. <laughs> Hello there. Meal service is the busiest time for the 21 crew, and each one has their own specific role. Depending on where we're seated for takeoff and landing, uh, depends on what we're doing, um, either in the cabin or in the galley. So basically I'm taking uh, the opportunity to get things ready for the dessert service now uh, while all the other cabin crew are out doing the bar service. Today, Aaron is one of the 10 crew looking after the 64 passengers in business class. Give the passengers a nice glass of wine with their meal, a small side salad where they get a choice of dressings, and then we start uh, delivering entrees and main course. with food and drink playing a crucial part of the long haul experience. Each year, over one billion meals are dished up at 40,000 feet. Qantas alone serves 7.5 million on their long haul flights. 400,000 in first class, two million in business, and five million in economy. Everywhere in the world, at any minute of the day, there's a plane up there and we're serving a meal to somebody. Neil Perry is one of Australia's best-known chefs. For 20 years, he's been putting the food he serves in his Rockpool restaurants into the sky. It can be a massive risk putting your name on something you have no control over. Airline food's always had a bad rap, so when we got involved, the most important thing is we created sort of a number of cornerstones. So we said, what have the airlines always done? Well, they've flown really bad bread, so we have to have great bread. They've flown pretty poor cheese. Let's have beautiful ripe cheeses that are ready. Salad, not great. Let's do great salads. And then we'd roll dishes around that. Today, all the food is prepared in huge catering centres. The 105 chefs at Alpha LSG in London produce 31,000 meals per day. In the premium cabins, each of the dishes must be dressed and plated the same way across every flight. It's going to be calm, collected, go along at step by step. No, it's all good. There is pressure, but hey, you can't let the nerves get to you. <laughs> Serving restaurant quality food is an idea that harks back to the pioneering days of aviation. Feeling peckish? Well, here's a sample of our in-flight dining. Anyone care for le crustace à la moselle? Mmm, très bien. You'd have had a seven-course meal. You'd be served by a steward who'd be wearing a white jacket and a white cap, like a waiter in a fine restaurant, really. This was served on the 14th of September, 1952. They started with lobster bisque, 
roast fillet of beef, fresh sliced peaches with kirsch, fresh double cream, martini cocktails, grand van de Bourgogne, and biscuit de boucher. I'm sorry about my French accent, but you get the idea. Creating the tricky dishes is one thing, but serving them is quite another, as in the air, both equipment and space are severely limited. This is a real ballet, isn't it? You're, you're it is. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit of a juggling act, yeah. It's like, yeah, a bit of a circus trick, this one. <laughs> yeah, it's like a waltz, like a dance. One moves one way and we move in and backwards and forwards. You are all jammed in a small area. You have to be very comfortable on the aircraft with people in your personal space. You do learn very quickly how to manoeuvre around. It's like we almost have eyes behind our heads because we sort of just like move away and we all just get out of each other's way. We can just sort of, you know, we never really collide anymore. We're used to it. Yeah, we come to work knowing that it's going to be full and we're trained to work when it's full and yeah, another day at the office. Next, we'll take a sneaky peek at life below stairs as we inspect the crew's secret quarters. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Flight 002 out of Heathrow is on its way to Sydney, Australia. As the world's only fully double-decker passenger plane, the A380's upper deck is mostly business class, while the lower deck is the main economy cabin. In row 81, Daniel and Bethany are enjoying a rare moment of calm. I think this is the first meal Mummy's had on without baby Eilis crying, saying, feed me first. So it's actually quite nice to, to do that, isn't it? The routine is whatever she wants, so... <laughs> when she's hungry, she will cry and she will ask for food. When she's tired, she will sleep. <laughs> the young parents are preparing to move away from their families to start a new life in Sydney. We're just kind of going to go out there, kind of research the area, look at the neighbourhoods, look at some houses, and just kind of look at what we potentially are letting ourselves in for in the future. We haven't got a clue what to expect. We could go there and we could hate it. We haven't got anyone nearby to help out. It's a big move for both of us, but. I'm not scared, because I know we're a good team. Three hours into the flight, and with service over, for some of the crew, it's a chance to sneak a quick break. Me and Grant, we just went to uh, check on all our passengers, and our passengers are all good, aren't they? Good? Absolutely. So we thought we're, we'd reward ourselves all with oh. a cheeky cup of tea, <laughs> didn't we, Grant? Cheers. So that's what we're doing now. Beatrice has been flying for nine years. For her, keeping the passengers happy is one of the things that keeps her in the air. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a people pleaser to a certain degree, and that's what I really like, meeting the people and, and making them leave happy. And I think I could be sat in an office 9 to 5, looking until it's 4.30, and, yeah, obviously there are some flights where I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to the end of this flight, but then my reward is that I'm in Dubai for 24 hours or I'm in Australia for three days, so I don't really know what more, what more you could wish for, really. But all that excitement does come at a price. So I'm just starting to get stuck into every cabin crew's favourite job, which is, as you can see, I've got my glove on, cleaning the toilets. So off I go. People tell you it's a glamorous job. I think they lied. So we just come and do this like every half an hour just to check all everything's well and good in the toilet. And look, there's some paper in there because no one likes going to the toilet with no paper. Give it a little spritz. Beautiful. If we have like a friendly family sort of atmosphere on board. Hello. Hello. We all go out together. I go to the beach. The clothes are really nice. The best part of this job, a cup of tea and the biscuit. Life. Today, the kangaroo route has a single stop of 90 minutes in the world's busiest airport, Dubai.
Welcome to Dubai. Recruited, refueled, and recatered, the plane is ready for the longest leg of the flight, 14 hours to Sydney. About to hop on the plane, not much longer. Back in the air, the crew are preparing for another meal service. We have a little trick that we like to call. Grant, you know about Tom Cruise, don't you? It's the hat. When we talk about Tom Cruise on the aircraft, we're not talking about famous movie star, are we? We're certainly not. We certainly are not. We are talking about tea and coffee. <laughs> How do you put them on the trolley? Tea, then coffee. So, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. There you go, fact of the day. On the upper deck, in business class, Belinda settles in for lunch. Miss Walston, you're joining us for something to eat. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is her first experience in the premium cabin, and she's not yet used to the restaurant-like service. So I'm serving a side salad with your meal, and I have a choice of dressings for you. I have a H balsamic, or I have a verjou. What's a verjou? Oh, funny you should ask. <laughs> and it's not just the food jargon she needs some help with. Aaron's just been telling me about the lifestyle of a... Yes. Flight attendant. Flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> That's the old day. So flight attendant. Flight attendant. Australian Belinda left home to pursue her dream as an actress and singer. I think I underestimated how hard it would be setting up in London. It's not easy to come over with like two suitcases and that's all you have. But she might have to get used to the high life as things are on the up. So we're getting married, um, legally married, which is. A little bit different for um, if you're in Australia, but in the UK, we can get married, which is incredible. Yeah, it's very exciting. So keep your eyes at the point that you're looking at, but just drop your nose down a little bit. And she's also landed the role of Judy Garland in a new West End show. I can't wait for my mum to see this. I don't think she'll quite believe it, but I think she'll be really proud of everything that I'm achieving over here. Judy really is going to Oz, isn't she, really? Judy's going to Oz. She's going back to Oz. Yes, absolutely. And Judy's travelling in style. The Qantas A380 has 64 business class seats. At up to eight times the cost of an economy seat, this premium cabin is vital to the success of the airline. What they're selling is exclusivity. It's that great sort of social cachet if you turn left at the top of the steps instead of turning right. For the airline, it's a question of economics. If you're a standard economy class traveler, they're not making much profit on you. In fact, they're hardly making anything at all. So in a sense, those business travelers who are paying a great deal more are paying for the ordinary passengers like you and me. We often see this cabin full on every flight. Lots of business travellers or people that have saved up for a little while to take that trip of a lifetime. It's very exclusive with the sky beds that go fully flat. You can have privacy. There's these mid-seat dividers. It's all about service tailored to the customer. Oh, business class is, is, is the business, really. It's not just the business class passengers who travel in comfort. In the forward hold, directly below first class, are the animals like Mitzi and Alfie. While it's not possible for owners to visit their pets in flight, if they're in the serenity of first class, they occasionally might hear them. Sometimes you can actually hear the dogs chatting to each other and barking, which can be a little bit distracting. It's really interesting hearing, <laughs> hearing those noises and thinking that your ears are playing tricks on you. Cruising at almost 40,000 feet, the A380 is one of the most comfortable planes in the sky. Quiet and stable, it travels at more than 500 miles an hour, almost effortlessly through the thin, frigid atmosphere. But it wasn't always this way. The early long-haul passengers had to endure flying much lower in primitive, unpressurized planes. OK, the good news about flying low, that's eight or 9,000 maximum 10,000 feet, is you get a good view of, of what's down below, the pyramids or the Taj Mahal or the Sydney Harbour Bridge. 
the bad news is, because you're going through the weather, your stomach is being thrown all over the place. And up to 50% of people in pre-war flights were nauseous, they were queasy, and a great many of those were actually vomiting on the floor. And it's interesting that when the first stewardesses were introduced, they had to be qualified nurses. No such problems today. As 10 hours into the flight, the lights dim for the passengers to get some rest. Although few of them realize that there is another secret compartment in the belly of the plane. And welcome to our secret sleepover <laughs> joint. <laughs> One big slumber party in here. <laughs> this is where the cabin crew go on their downtime. Naomi and Sarah have agreed to show us around. <laughs> so these are the bunk beds. There's 12, 12, 12 bunk beds. beds. Crew rest is the best thing on the aircraft. <laughs> Hi guys. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Hi. 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 We are ready for a nap. <laughs> we might get three hours off and then we'll switch and then the next person will get the three hours off. Yeah, do a demonstration of how we get into the top bunk. Two beds now. <laughs> And do you normally have a hot water bottle down here? Normally, because it's freezing down here. It can get quite cold. <laughs> Great. No, no. Good night. <laughs> we get cosy pillows, blankets, hot water bottles. You know, you're lucky you don't see us in our pyjamas, but uh, we save that for down there. But yeah, it's just like a little cosy compartment underground. <laughs> and where's the Harry Potter bunk? <laughs> Tim? Uh, who gets the Harry Potter bunk? Yeah, we do have one bunk, which we call the Harry Potter bunk, which is just under the stairs. All right, let's this go, Tim. Very pretty. <laughs> it's the easiest I've ever done that. Oh, good job. Oh. <laughs> I actually don't mind it, because it's like someone's actually giving you a hug under there, because it's like you've got a wall that's halfway through and you're kind of just all, you know, cosy up in there and it's quite warm. Good night, everyone. <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. Nice and cosy. <laughs> It's not just the cabin crew getting some rest. Even pilots get a moment or two to enjoy the scenery. There's a lot to see, and you've got your map so you know where you are, and you see some great sunrises, sunsets, uh, good mountains. In the economy cabin is 28-year-old Australian Sean. Living in the UK, he's been plotting with Dad to be the surprise guest at his mum's 60th birthday party. So mum's going to walk into the restaurant and all her and her friends are going to be there, so that's going to be brilliant. And then the icing on top of the cake should be when you walk in. <laughs> yeah. My mum's very emotional. I think when she sees me, she's probably going to scream, run and hug me, possibly even cry. Um, I think she'll be very entertaining. Sean's not the only one with secrets. Sometimes I guess we do get a few weird requests, such as marriage proposals, <laughs> after they've had a few wines. You just make sure that they know that we're just there for their safety and the service. We're not, you know, there for anything else. <laughs> Hello to you. Next, with just a thousand miles to run, in Sydney, a whole army prepare to welcome flight 002. With flight 002 now just hours from Sydney, the international airport prepares to open after its overnight curfew. Are you doing the two arrival as well? I'm not sure yet. Not sure, OK. On board, the pilots make contact with the air traffic okay. control. Qantas 2 Super, hello to you. Qantas 2, turn right heading 020. Right heading 020, Qantas 2. Air traffic control is pretty much a policeman of the skies. We make sure that the rules and procedures are followed and that separation standards uh, aren't breached. Keeping the planes apart takes a special kind of skill. You need to be able to think fast on your feet. You need that spatial awareness. Uh, a lot of people think in two-dimensional, but we're thinking in three-dimensional, but we're also thinking four-dimensional at times because we've got speed involved as well. Meanwhile, in the daily briefing at the IOC, it's the weather that's the worry. 
uh, Sydney. We are looking at uh, storm potential staying quite likely within the next two hours at the airport, those storm cells hugging the coast. Whether or not there's going to be a, a tropical cyclone um, over the flight path of several flights becomes increasingly important to high passenger volume flights such as those that go to China, or those that go to London. We are looking at storm cells to the northwest of port and they are likely to move over. Do you think they're fast moving there? Now? They're quite fast moving. We have some stuff to the southwest at the moment, but that should stay offshore. I'm just concerned that those things that are developing to the northwest. While the worst of the storms are not yet over Sydney, the pilots prepare to land in some typically British weather. I end up with some rain at the latter stage from the approach they just stand by the white ones. In the cabin, as the dawn breaks, the crew prepare breakfast. So as you can see, it's sunrise on the plane. I'm just gonna go through and check on any passengers that might have woken up, just see if we can get them any drinks or anything like that. The last service was hours ago, so I guess they're ready for their their brekkie before they land. What can we get for you? Are you sure we can grab it for you now? My first order of cheeky James Bogues at sunrise. Josh here is loading up the oven. Doing a great job of being galley operator. Down in the crew quarters, the early morning alarm call is less welcome. I've just come downstairs to do the worst job, which is waking everyone up from break. And everyone's still down here and they're not very happy. It can give you a heart attack at the past of times. But, um, <laughs> and then when that hand does come up, you're like, OK, and then you come up and you feel sorry for any passengers that do come across to you in that process between going from the crew rest door to the toilet. <laughs> One of my favourite things during the flight is to see the crew that are coming back from break and how upset they look after coming back from break. Here's Edward. He's looking really happy. Morning. In the first-class galley, Marissa is tackling a tricky dish. Fresh scrambled eggs cooked in a steam oven. We've got to keep a close eye on it. Constantly stir it because if I take my eye off them, I either burn them or they go a bit dry, which we don't want. <laughs> Is there extra pressure being in the first class galley because of uh... Oh, yes. Platinum passengers, little nerves, but all good. Yeah, uh, you set your watches to Sydney time. The time thing at Sydney is. Uh... It's 7.35 a.m. Yeah, I'm just seeing where we are. We're just flying over Canberra now, I think. So, um, yeah, we, I think we touched down in like 36 minutes, which is really exciting. Sean, too, is excited, having travelled 11,000 miles just to be his mother's very special birthday present, literally. My plan is to get a box that's big enough to fit me, wrap it up in paper, maybe put a bow on it. I think when I leap out of the box, I think my mum's going to scream, <laughs> panic a little bit, and then once she realises who it is, uh, she'll probably give me a big hug, probably start crying. Um, I think it would be very entertaining. Keeping the emotions in check is also going to be a challenge for Malcolm, who after 65 years is now just minutes away from meeting his long lost family. First time meeting him, pulling in the flat. Oh, his nerves will be going now. Oh, my nerves are going. <laughs> a bit emotional. A bit. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and it's not just Malcolm feeling the nerves. As at Sydney Airport, his welcoming party has arrived. My two sisters are here with me, um, my partner, my daughter, my grandson, and my nephew. We are so excited. Nerves have been chattering all the way down here. Yes, yeah, really excited. Can't wait to see him. Qantas 2, turn right heading 125 to join final 16 right. And you are cleared the ILS PRM approach. Right heading 125, join final 16 right, cleared the PRM approach. 16 right. With the runway in sight, 
the plane enters its most critical phase, landing. And the A380's massive size creates a huge amount of weight turbulence, or jet wash. Weight turbulence is the unstable air that is produced from the wings and the body of the aircraft as it flies through the air. The weight turbulence hangs behind uh, the aircraft for a period of time, and uh, we put like an envelope around the aircraft. So we've got 1,000 feet below, and for a super, it's six nautical miles behind it. So we don't want anything in that envelope, uh, otherwise they, they get buffeted around a lot. If you're quite close to the, the weight turbulence coming off the back of uh, a super or a heavy, and you're in a light aircraft like a Cessna, it could flip the aircraft. One is two, wind one three zero degrees, one zero knots, runway one six right, clear to land. While the A380 can land automatically, usually this part is handled by the human pilots. I am visual, standard procedures, check. 1,000. In tough conditions, they can be challenging. Crosswinds make it harder. Usually happens just in the last little bit. And at that stage, you nearly are always flying it manually. It's probably the most satisfying part. You try and fly the aeroplane as efficiently as you can and do a good landing if possible. If you do, you, you basically feel satisfied that it was a good job. <gasps> it's landed. Oh my god, it's here. He's landed. Is he? Oh, wow. We're going we're to see him in a minute. Oh, wow. He's going to be so excited. How exciting. How exciting. Malcolm is just moments away from coming face to face with his past. Flight 002 from London has just landed into Sydney International Airport, where a small army of service personnel are ready to welcome the plane. How many baggage containers you got to take off? Four more to go. You got to use these ones here. Ramp manager Sam Shannon oversees the offloading. It's almost like a Corriere Air dance. We've got engineering staff that are overviewing the aircraft and looking for any damage that might have occurred in flight. Uh, we've got our ground service team that are offloading all the baggage and cargo. We also have catering come to the aircraft and start offloading all the rubbish from the inbound flight. Refuelers are also coming around to refuel the aircraft. With the flight burning through over 300,000 litres of fuel, the plane has lost half its takeoff weight, although a little extra has been added. Obviously, after such a long flight with over 480 passengers, there's a lot of toilet waste, so this gentleman now is just taking it out of the aircraft and also flushing all the tanks in the aircraft to make sure they're all clean for the next flight. So, contrary to God belief, we, you don't dump it in the air? No, we don't dump it in the air, I can assure you of that. Sam's team need to get all the passengers reunited with their 600 bags in less than 45 minutes. And for three special ladies, that can't happen soon enough. It'll take them a little while to get through customs and then get their bags and stuff, so... With all the passengers disembarked, the crew can finally clock off. But while it's goodbyes for the crew, Malcolm's three sisters are desperate to say hello. Come on. Finally, after what has literally been a lifetime, Malcolm arrives. Here we go, where are they? You'll let them near you. Fantastic. Can't believe it. I know. So long. 
Oh, I can't wait to tell him just about our dad, what he was like growing up. It's a little bit bittersweet, sort of, we don't want to tell him too much. I want to think he's missed out on everything, but he just wants to hear about everything that we shared with Dad. Oh. Great to find them. I mean, 65, the only one, four months ago. Now I've got three sisters. How lucky are you? How lucky me? <laughs> yeah. You're here! With the plane due to be back in the air in just seven hours, there is just enough time for some regular maintenance. The tug has now grabbed it, closed its jaws, and we're elevating the aircraft up, so it's pivoting on its landing gear. The dead weight of this aircraft at the moment, possibly about 300 odd tonne. We're going to follow the A380 line out just to keep these wing tips clear from all surrounding aircrafts all around us. It's that big, you can have an accident. You could hit a wing on something, so you must concentrate on having it onto the centre of those lines. With the engineering hangar on the opposite side of the airport, Louis must tow the 73 metre long aircraft across a live runway and quickly. We're going to have to go. We've been cleared, we've got lights illuminated. There's an aircraft coming in and it's on its final approach, so we have to move. And that aircraft's pretty close. What's well, coming in now? Well done, Louis. Here we go. This seven-storey hangar was specially converted to accommodate the giant A380. And even then, it only just fits. The aircraft is very high and was a great challenge for us. A lot of the equipment that we need to do a job at uh, normal human level has to be elevated to those heights. It's not just getting the people there, it's getting some of the specialised tooling there as well. One of the regular jobs is to give the giant plane a good scrub. wet the aircraft and you'll apply the foam over the aircraft, scrub it off, rinse it off. So how do they get dirt? I mean, they're flying in the air. Bugs, moths, the rubber coming off the tyres, hitting the back of the aircraft, the exhaust fumes, hydraulic leaks, all sorts of various ways they can get dirty. And all this effort is not just for show. Obviously, for our customers to look at a bright and shiny aeroplane is very nice. However, there's a hidden agenda there in fuel burn. I mean, a clean aeroplane, their fuel burn is significantly reduced. While our plane is being readied for its next trip, Belinda has finally made it home. Australia has a smell, this sort of fresh grass kind of smell is just like... I can't explain it, it's, it's quite comforting. It's very emotional coming back to an old life that I used to have, you know? But it's also just so nice to be able to see Mum. Yvonne's delighted that Belinda's musical theatre career is taking off at last. Very proud of her. Finally, she's going to be considered a professional and getting paid. And that's, uh, yes. I've been paid before, though, Mum. For yeah, but not <laughs> not um, like West End theatre as well. West End known. is definitely a, yes. a first for me, definitely. It's not just Belinda that's happy to be home. Next, the rest of the passengers have their own emotional reunions. You found a great spot for him, anyway. So we're in Sydney now, and uh, we're just off to our first destination, Fuji. The Kangaroo Route is just one of the thousands of long-haul flights that deliver passengers around the world. 
as each day tens of thousands of travellers begin their own journeys. We've got a beautiful view behind us of Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Sydney Opera House. For Daniel and Bethany, their journey is just getting started as they scope out a possible future in Sydney. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Let's have a look around. So we've got a lovely open plan kitchen lounge dining. Bedrooms just to uh, your left here. Oh, the mirror's sold straight away. <laughs> and waking up to that every morning. Oh, wow, yes. I fell in love with the apartment, to be honest with you. It's perfectly located. That balcony in the mornings, having a cup of coffee or having some breakfast. It's really settled our nerves. Yeah. Kind of coming out here and seeing how beautiful Sydney is. We're looking forward to it. My nan summed it up. She, she said, it'll break my heart to see you go. And, but at the same time, it's the best thing for you. And if, if my grandpa was still alive, he'd be proud of us for moving out here. Because this is a big step, but she knows that for our future, this is the best move for us. And this is where our future lies. While Daniel and Bethany look to the future, for Mitzi and Alfie, after 10 days in quarantine, it's a case of home at last. I've just got off the phone with your parents. They're very excited to see you. I've got them out at the airport in Sydney, just to stretch their legs, chance to go to the toilet. And both of their body languages were fantastic. They handled the flight really well. They're both happy and obviously glad to be on the ground. <laughs> While the dogs settle in at home, back at the airport, the countdown is on to get the next long haul flight out on time. And then Colonel Billy Emergency Equipment Security Check call back in about one minute's time. You want to start heading towards your doors. Thanks, everyone. We have one minute before callback. And then about 10 minutes before passengers board. But the crew aren't the only ones on a countdown. It's good to be back in Sydney. As Sean and his brother put the final touches to his mum's ultimate birthday surprise. This is my brother Mark. He's picked me up in Manly. The plan is to cover this box. Um, I'm going to put a couple of eyes on it and so I've got a couple of peepholes. There's already some cutouts on the side, so as she goes to open the box, I'm going to pop my arms out. It's not going to be neat, but it will do. Sean takes up his position as mum is due at any moment. Oh, they're coming. We're going to hear some yells any second now. Oh He's not the only one undercover. We've told Mum that our camera crew are making a promotional film for the restaurant. North of Sydney, Malcolm is having a very different family reunion. Oh, you show me the way. Hi, Dad. We're all here. I told you I found your boy. Yeah, 65 years ago. Yep. <clears throat> here we go again. 
Thank you. <laughs> it's been totally emotional since I've been here, finding you three and my dad's grave. It, um, you can't explain it. Fabulous. Turned me well right around. I'm sure he had something to do with it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He's probably oh, yeah. sorted it out. Yeah, sorted it out, yeah. In just a few months, the first non-stop 19-hour flight from the UK to Australia will begin. A technological leap forward that will further shrink our world. Yet while another long-haul milestone will be achieved, the spirit and romance of long-distance travel remains. As each year, long-haul flights transport millions of people billions of miles to reconnect those who are half the world away. Even though we've been doing it now for half a century, there's sort of certain magic about long haul, which you can't equal with a short haul hop of 90 minutes. In a sense, long haul is what aviation is really about. This is Dad on his journey over wow. here. Wow. I've never seen that one before. No. That's going up on bedroom beside Elvis. <laughs> <laughs>